Next up, I would like to introduce James Har, who will be presenting testing IPv6 only networks. James is a network automation engineer at Internet2 and traveled from Omaha, Nebraska to join us today. This is James' first uh, time presenting at Nanog, and it's a pleasure to have him speaking with us today. Welcome to the stage, James. All right, as he's already stated, uh, I'm one of my hobbies has been testing IPv6 only network as, at networks recently. Um, and I think that there's uh, there's an opportunity that we have here to push forward deployment and uh, that's something I wanted to share. So uh, let's see. I don't know that the slide advance is working. So while we're figuring that out, um, uh, just a quick little bit about Internet 2. Um, Internet 2 is a national research and education network that serves the higher ed community. We are led by our community members. Ah, uh, there we go. We're led by our community members. Uh, we, uh, we run a national network inside the United States. Um, and it, chances are, if there's data going between universities, it's a it, good chance it's going to go over our network. Uh, we also do Edge Rome, which is federated uh, uh, single sign-on for university students. So if you sign on on one campus, you can get Wi-Fi in one of the other campuses. Um, and we also do federated sign-on for single sign-on services. So, um, so in this, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some events in IPv6. And uh, this isn't going to surprise anybody uh, These in this room. Uh, I'm going to look at different ways we can measure IPv6 adoption. Um, and I'm going to look at different ways we can operate IPv6 only networks. I'm going to focus on a on sort of the client side, so I'm not going to look at how to run server networks. It's mostly in client, and I'll should tell you why in a little bit. Um, and about this time last year, I applied for an IPv6 or sorry, an Aaron Community Grant to specifically test IPv6 networks and make it easier to test those things because. Uh, it's been kind of a hassle to get those things set up. I'm also going to tell you about where the project is uh, after that. So uh, is anybody in this room 25 years old or younger? I see a few. IPv6 is older than you. <laughs> it's been out for a while. And in fact, the concepts have probably been around even longer than that. But um, over my career in, in networking, I've gone through sort of a optimism about IPv6 where I think this is really cool, I want to get it working, uh, and to a, well, it's gonna get here when it's gonna get here, and you know I'll, I'll deal with it then. And I've even been guilty of sort of nixing IPv6 from a project when I needed to cut scope to get something done when, when I was doing network engineering. Uh, but then as I came to Internet2 about four years ago, um, I got a little bit more excited about it because I saw more. I saw some usage of it, and I wanted to, uh, you know, started looking into it more and looked at, uh, at how things run. Uh, there's a couple really important things that have happened. A lot of people are familiar with the government IPv6, U.S. government IPv6 only mandate, uh, and there's a couple other really important things that I'll, I'll sort of talk about. There's a an RFC out that's specifically for IPv6 operations. How to IPv6 only operations and considerations you might need to take into account if you want to try that. Uh, and then Microsoft in March this year announced that it's going to ex uh, extend or expand CLAT support in Windows 11. Um, so before we get there, let's talk about how we measure IPv6. There's, uh, there's a few different ways, and I think uh, one important way is uh, something that Jeff Huston does where uh, he looks at a lot at the routing table, how many advertisements are coming through, um, and the trends. And it's kind of challenging to announce because you'll announce a different number of IPv6 uh, networks or prefixes than you would IPv4 in a lot of cases. Um, that's one way. We can also look at overall traffic where we're looking at the percentage of traffic that is uh, v6 only, or sorry, coming in over v6 versus the amount of traffic that might be coming in over v4. And uh, again, I think everybody in this room has probably seen this trend. Uh, it's, it's not new. We're getting closer and closer to that 50% mark. Um, and so when I came to Internet 2, I'm, I wanted to answer the question, how is Internet 2 doing itself? And um, I was saddened a little bit. 
So as it turns out, that difference between advertising prefixes and, uh, and actually using IPv6, there's a gap there. And when we look at, sort of, when we look at this, uh, the, the, the left column is the amount of IPv4 traffic that we see from a given a origin ASN, and then the right is the amount of IPv6. And in some cases, there's absolutely no traffic, but in most, we're seeing just a trickle. And as it turns out, they have, they have IPv6 deployed in a core network, but they're afraid to turn on, uh, in many cases, they're afraid to turn, on, uh, turn it on for the end users or servers or whatever they're, they're running in their networks. Um, but again, what we do find is when they do turn it on, for, especially for end user networks, their usage goes anywhere, up to anywhere between 30 and 60% just automatically. Um, it's, it's a significant increase. And so that's one area where I think you could potentially have some e fairly easy gains because user networks, uh, especially depending on the network, and universities where I come from, that is a big significant chunk of what we do is we, uh, we serve students. We, get, we have a lot of students that come through faculty, staff, a lot of end user devices. And so if you can get it there, then you'll see a significant increase. Uh, there's other ways that we can measure this. Uh, there's other, uh, um, other observation points. What I showed was just Google and just the routing table. But other, uh, you'll see variations in that, like different percentages. Um, so running an IPv6, or sorry, running a dual stack network, for the longest time I thought that this was the way to go. We're just gonna do dual stack, run both of them, and turn off E4 when we're done. Um, and as it turns out, running two protocols is, it, it's a lot of extra work. Um, and I actually heard someone at breakfast this morning describe it as technical debt. As soon as you turn on v V6, IPv4 is now technical debt. We're not stopping there, we need to get to V6 only networks. Um, so why would you wanna do this? Like I said, it's extra work to run uh, two different networks. Um, I also think that there's a, a case to be made that it's uh, that you hide issues less when you run an IPv6 only network. Um, and also I think if you look over time, the burden on those transition mechanisms, uh, and we'll look over those in just a minute, is uh, it'll reduce over time instead of like where you're using carrier grade NAT where the burden on those devices uh, and, and will increase over time as more and more things as you see more traffic and as you see more IPv6 available, you're, you'll have to buy larger and larger systems to run carrier grade NAT. So what, what in our toolbox do we have to support IPv6 only? Obviously there's going to be some websites that are operating on v4 only. A big example that, <laughs> that people point out is, uh, is github.com does not have a quad A record. Um, they, it's just been that way forever uh, and it hasn't changed. So in networking, we usually end up with a, uh, small, uh, a small grab bag of different technologies we can put together. And uh, a little over a year ago, I learned a little bit more about these. And I think it's actually making a pretty good case that for end user networks, you can now, uh, you can actually deploy these V6 only networks. And so we're gonna go over these technologies pretty quick. Um, so, uh, I'll skip forward just a minute. So when we look at IPv6 only networks, um, so the first one is NAT64. All this is is it's a IPv6 prefix that you that you dedicate uh, to doing translation, and you put in a device that will do uh, that'll translate that you embed the IPv4 address that you want to get to in that IPv6 prefix. And then you send the traffic into an IPv6 only network and when it hits that NAT64 appliance, it'll pull out that IPv4 address and say, this is where they actually wanna to get to and then go over the IPv4 internet. Um, so it's a pretty straightforward, it, it's a pretty straightforward way of uh, providing IPv6, uh, IPv4 over IPv6, but how do you actually get traffic to flow over that? when all you're getting is, a, is an A record and not a quad A record, you're not getting that V6 address. Well, we tell our DNS servers to lie to us. Uh, as soon as, is, and the way DNS64 works is, as soon as you get a uh, request that comes in for a quad A record, and if one doesn't exist, but it sees an A record, it'll synthesize that, that fake address for us and tell the client to connect to this NAT64 address. Um, another way that, uh, Another technique in the bucket is uh, 464 XLAT. 
And there's a bunch of different ways to, uh, to deploy this, but I'm specifically looking at, uh, at the at installations where the CLAT device uh, is, on the customer, is on the customer device, the client device, sorry. And I think that, again, this is what makes it kind of exciting to look at these things as a possibility. Um, and so I'm going to skip forward just a little bit because I'm a little bit behind. So NAT64, we already talked about. The process for using it is you have to pair NAT, uh, DNS64 and NAT64 together. The DNS result, resolver lies to the client, says, here's the IPv6 address you can get to. And then when traffic goes, uh, when traffic, when the client generates traffic, it'll go through a NAT64 appliance that will, uh, it'll wind up at the v4 internet. And um, let's see. And for the 464x LAT, there is a, uh, it's a little bit different. But what's exciting about it is that the client device actually thinks it has an IPv4 address. And this is important because uh, there's certain software that, for a couple of reasons, may not even try IPv6. Maybe it's a hard-coded IP address. Maybe it's a, uh, maybe it just selects an address family that is v4 only. It doesn't even try v6. And, um, uh, and as it turns out, there's actually quite a bit of support out there right now for it. Um, it's not universal, but it's getting there. Um, so to use for, uh, what ends up happening is each client device gets an address 192.0.0.1, and every device in, that has 464x lab enabled will see that as an interface that it will, it'll have. When the software generates traffic, it'll then get tunneled over, uh, it'll go to a piece of software called the CLAT, and then it will then do, uh, it'll embed the IPv4 destination in that, in the destination address, or in that NAT64 prefix, and get that traffic off to a PLAT. In this case, we're going to look at NAT64, uh, a NAT64 appliance that'll function as that PLAT that'll translate it back to IPv4. Um, so there's a couple different ways of configuring 464x LAT. Uh, the way that I think is the nicest, uh, and I'm just because it seems the cleanest, is to throw that prefix into an IPv6 router advertisement. Um, it's not it's not widely supported yet in network operating systems, but it's getting there. They're moving along pretty quickly. Um, the other one, which I think is rather sneaky, is there is a special use domain name called ipv4only.arpa that will only ever return an IPv4 address. And what a client device will do is it'll go look that up, look up a quality on that one, and if it sees a response, it now knows your prefix for 6 to 4 translation. It knows your NAT64 prefix. Um, and as it turns out, there are quite a few devices that support that. In particular, iOS and macOS are uh, two that will utilize that out of the box to basically set up 464 xlat automatically. You don't have to do anything. Um, so after we, when we look at IPv6 only networks, there's a lot of problems that you can run into. Um, you know, obviously, if there's no server side IPv6 and you don't have any transition mechanisms, it's not going to work. Um, sometimes you could have that hard-coded IPv4 literal or address family and that's not going to work. I even had it where an application will function just fine except for doing a sign-in. Like if I want to sign into the application, it won't work. But once I'm signed in, I can flip to an IPv6 only network and it functions fine. So testing IPv6 only networks is, uh, it, it's non-trivial. -trivial. You can't just look at a packet capture and say, I'm using IPv6 for this application. I see that it works. It needs to exist in an IPv6 only network. Um, and so I mentioned support. Uh, 464xlat kind of brings in sort of that, uh, that full package of like, if everything else fails, this will, have, this will kind of cover you in most client devices. In iOS, Android, Mac OS, they all support it. Windows uh, 11 has the code for it. Sorry, Windows 10 and 11 has a code for it, but right now it's on LTE only. And I had mentioned how Microsoft mentioned, uh, said they announced that they were going to expand support for that. Um, there's no timeline yet, but uh, that I know of. I think it might, there might be one announced. But uh, they're going to expand that to non-LTE interfaces. So if you get Wi-Fi or wired networks, um, it, it'll be there. Uh, Linux and FreeBSD and OpenBSDs, uh, they don't have it out of the box. Like if you just connect to an IPv6 only network, they won't you know, automatically uh, have that have those features enabled, uh, but I think that's 
um, you're not going to see as many of those client devices, but I'd also like to see some developments where those things are enabled out of the box. The tools exist, but just kind of go, it's one of those go build your own solution out of it. Um, there's also an IPv6 only, or sorry, IPv6 mostly option that client devices that understand this DHCP v4 option will turn off v4. If they don't understand it, they'll continue to use it. So that's another uh, tool you could use in your toolbox. Um, so that brings us to the uh, IPv6 test pod grant. Um, when I was first setting these things up, uh, my home internet connection uh, does not have v6 natively. I had to, I have to tunnel to get it. Um, and as much, it, it, as annoying as I found that, I ended up you know, getting it done. I have a tunnel set up. I have v6 access. Now I need to set up these different, um, these different Wi-Fi SSIDs to test different devices on them. And not only that, I have different scenarios I need to test. Um, and that turned out to be a hassle because when you look at these different things, setting up a NAT64 appliance, uh, not everything out of the box supports it. Uh, DNS64, you got to go configure that. Uh, and if you want to do something like uh, PREF64 or DHCP option 108, uh, it's you got to assemble all these things from different components. There's nothing that's like out of the box that's ready to go. And I'm a fairly seasoned network engineer, and this took me a couple of weeks to sort of assemble this. And granted, it was on you know it was in my own time, in my spare time, but it still took me a while. And if you look at people like the develop software developers, application support people, they're not going to have time to go do that, and their network engineers may may or may not be interested in that. So. What are ways that we can help get them uh, the test environments they need to push this forward, to push forward support for IPv6 only? Uh, so like I mentioned, there's a whole bunch of setup that needs to go into, uh, into all this. And at the very bottom, like you still need to do your day job. Like For me, this is a good hobby project. I get a lot of latitude to do it during work, uh, but not everybody does. And your organization may not you know, there's a lot of moving pieces in organizations. You may have to talk to network engineers. You may have to talk to systems administrators to get these things set up. And it may just be too much trouble to overcome right away. Uh, so the IPv6 test pod grant is, uh, it's, it's here, uh, it's uh, intended to take these little inexpensive routers, load some custom software on them, and it will provide an IPv6 network, and more importantly, different configurations of IPv6 only networks. Um, it'll tunnel out to a service that's part of the project, so, uh, so you don't have to worry about getting native IPv6 access. And, um, and it just, the idea is that it makes it easy to have something you plug in and you can start testing with. And you can try out different environments. How does my application work when it doesn't have any transition mechanism at all? Um, will it work? Will my single sign-on work? And uh, the idea behind it is that uh, it'll set up a bunch of little SSIDs and um, you can rotate through them. You pick which one you want, you connect, you see if the software works, and then hopefully we'll give you some insight as to, uh, as to where, uh, what you need to do to help improve that. And it could be some simple, simple software patches. Maybe it's uh, change the address family that you're using. Um, oops, back. So, you know, I mentioned uh, the, this application developer and IT support person as uh, people who might be interested in something like this, some easy way to, uh, to get access to these IPv6 only test environments. Um, uh, you could also be a network engineer and just maybe not have time or maybe you're starting to look at these things and you don't, you want to have an easy way to play around with it. Um, these devices are gonna be made at no cost to project participants, all you have to do is sign up. And, uh, you know, of course, there's hardware limits because money's not infinite. Um, so we can only serve a certain number of people. But, uh, but if you have a use case for trying out IPv6 only networks, even if you're a, an enthusiast, it's, uh, it's a project that you can apply for. Um, so on the project timeline, um, you know, we had uh, six months to, uh, to sort of purchase an initial batch of hardware, different pieces. Um, different models to see what would actually work because as it turns out, uh, software support on, on uh, Wi-Fi chipsets kinda, is kind of hard. So you know, we wanted to try and use as much out of the box. And we also picked uh, operating systems, uh, tried a couple different ones out. We're gonna we end up using uh, uh, OpenWRT 
uh, because it has all the different components we need to make this work. Um, and we're, we're actually just now accepting applications. We have everything approved by Internet2 Legal since we're handling the tunnel termination. Um, so we'll have a little, we'll have a link to that at the end. Um, and then what we want to do is gather feedback from project participants, like what, what were you able to fix? Um, what did you observe? What worked? What didn't? And which direction are you moving in? Are you going to, are you going to look at these kinds of networks in your own production environment? Um, so like I said, uh, we are open for applications now. We also have an announcement mailing list that's there. It's linked to on the website. Uh, or if you want to, um, I'll be available to talk after, after this and I, uh, um, uh, in the hallway, go come find me or email me directly, but it's free hardware. Um, if you want to sign up and try it out and, uh, you know, let's push this forward because I'm tired of waiting for IPv6. It needs to happen. So uh, thank you. Any questions? Ron Bonica, Juniper Networks. Mm -hmm. You talked about the cost of running dual stack and keeping IPv4 around. Mm -hmm. Given the complexity of the transition mechanisms, which is actually more painful, dual stack or the transition mechanisms? Well, I don't know that it's going to... I'm not going to say it's less painful, but I think in certain situations it might be. Uh, I think in different networks, it's going to be... Which, which might be? Uh, oh, sorry. It, one, like IPv6 only with transition technologies might wind up being less hassle than doing dual stack everywhere. And I just think that the technologies that are coming to client devices now are actually getting to the point where the pain may... The pain of running IPv6 only with transition mechanisms might actually outweigh... Might actually be less pain than running dual stack. Is, is it a matter that in one case the pain is on the end user and in another case it's on the operator? Possibly. I mean, the, the, if it's pain on the end user, it's going to be pain on the network operator because who are they going to go to if it doesn't work? Yeah. Uh, and there, you know, there may be cases where running dual stack is the way your organization needs to go. That's not my decision to make. The, 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 case, in, the case I want to make is that this is something worth looking at and trying out. And obviously don't roll it out if it doesn't work. <laughs> you know, so that's what the test pod is there for. It's there to make it easier to test and say, get over that fear factor of, is this actually even viable? Yes, it's a good idea to figure out where the pain is with mm -hmm. real operational yep. experience. Yes. And that's why it's an Aaron Community Grant is, uh, it's not just for us. I'm not presenting this to you saying, here you go do it. I'm saying here's something that's easy. You just plug it in and try and try it out. And okay, thank you. Good work. You're welcome. Thank you. Online question mm -hmm. uh, from Stephen: What was the biggest challenge developing the test pod? Um, so I bought a bunch of hardware, and I was thinking, you know, oh, it's open WRT, it's Linux, it'll probably support the Wi-Fi chipsets. I was wrong. <laughs> uh, uh, I think. Honestly, it was a combination of the hardware, uh, trying, trying to figure out uh, as an organization how to host the tunnel uh, termination point, and um, uh, probably getting out of my own way with it. <laughs> that, that was probably the hardest part. Um, for if, you know, if I was in the community listening to this presentation, I think the hardest part of me setting up an environment like this is assembling all the pieces together. Um, I've done that once and that this is my way of sharing that with other people and how to, you know, this is a way to illustrate that this, you know, here's what it looks like without you having to go assemble the pieces yourself. I don't know if that was a great answer, but that's what I got. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Lindsay. I'm with the X Mission. Um, first of all, love the uh, talk. Um, I especially appreciate your findings showing that once you enable IPv6, like on the uh, client or subscriber side, mm -hmm. that you actually saw the data actually showed that it was 
utilized. Yeah. Um, I think that's a very, um, I think that's a point that gets missed a lot where a lot of, you know, arguments of, you know, where or why IPv6 isn't being deployed, you know, a lot of people either depend, you know, blame the operator, the end user or the developers or a mix of both, but it is, that's kind of been our experience is we have deployed a dual stat network that, um, you know, we do see that utilization, you know, a lot of uh, apps, you know, end user devices are designed to use IPv6 if it is available, um, they will, you know, prioritize that kind of traffic, but, um, you know, it is that kind of that one of those, you know, uh, where do you start first, you know, do you, does the operator deploy it first, so, um, very, I think this is a great project to kind of mm. help bridge that gap to see how we can, uh, you know, encourage that utilization going forward. So thank you for the talk. All right. Thank you. Um, I think it's one, one thing that's important to say that I didn't mention in the talk is that uh, uh, if you have a, f a cell phone on T-Mobile, you are using these transition technologies already. Um, uh, I don't think it's any secret that this is how that works, but T-Mobile runs an IPv6 only network and then they rely on 464 XLAT to, to make that work. So I think that's also another important thing that I think you just reminded me of, so. That's it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.